the committee is all here. We can introduce ourselves and start with Brian. Yep. Senator Brian Collimore representing the Rutland District. Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Uh, Bobby Starr from Orleans, Essex County. Chris Pearson, Chittenden County. Anthony Fleet of Washington County. So, uh, thanks for calling in, and uh, could you uh, give us a little bit about yourself, and we'll start right in with the testimony. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, Judy Belair, I'm representing the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club, and uh, I'm a volunteer with the chapter, but I have a background in um, with the Minnesota chapter of the Sierra Club as a lobbyist for 13 years. Um, and so I would like to say that as the Sierra Club, the Vermont chapter strongly supports this legislation. And I hope we can agree that less pesticide use should be our goal. As we all know, pesticides are a poison. They can contaminate the environment and harm people. They can and do kill beneficial insects, along with a small, very small percentage of what we consider to be crop pests. And by killing insects, pesticides have impacts up the food chain. Also, many of them are toxic to more than just insects. Birds, amphibians, mammals, and humans can also be at risk. So, if we agree that less pesticide use should be our goal, are we doing anything about it in Vermont? When the Pesticide Advisory Council was established decades ago, a main focus was to assess the use of pesticides and recommend reduction strategies. Unfortunately, that focus was lost, and that's why we need this legislation. This legislation, I believe, will help us reduce pesticide use in Vermont. S-272 includes a definition of integrated pest management. If this policy were implemented, it will lead to the reduced use of pesticides and reduced resistance in insect pests because it establishes the policy that pesticides are only used as a last resort. Currently, pesticides such as neonicotinoids are applied to plants and crops whether or not a pest problem exists. The Pollinator Protection Committee, which was established by this legislature, as you know, recommended in its report that, quote, pesticides used in Vermont should be based upon need, not used prophylactically, unquote. Eric Boar, a member of the committee and then president of the Vermont Tree Fruit Growers Association, said, quote, integrated pest management should be the foundation of any grower program regardless of crop. Demonstrating a need for a pesticide application does not have to be some great endeavor or burden for a grower. They should be able to articulate that need and have a record of their specific pest pressures for that growing year. The Pollinator Protection Committee voted eight to one to pass the recommendation of no prophylactic use. And I believe the agency voted to oppose this recommendation. So it would be interesting to find out the Agency of Agriculture's opinion on prophylactic use. I would also like to mention one prophylactic use in Vermont that could easily be eliminated, the use of neonicotinoid coated soybean seed. Six years ago in 2014, the EPA's Biological and Economic Analysis Division concluded that, quote, which data indicate that in most cases there is no difference in soybean yield when soybean seed was treated with neonicotinoids versus not receiving any insect control treatment. Still quoting, in comparison to the next best alternative, pest control measures, neonicotinoid seed treatments likely provide zero dollars in benefits to growers, unquote. So the question is why we are still allowing this use in Vermont. It just doesn't make sense. The concept of ITN has been around since the 1950s. It was formulated into national policy in the United States in February 1972 when Nixon directed federal agencies to take steps to advance the application of ITN in all relevant sectors. But how much ITN is actually being practiced in Vermont? The University of Vermont Extension does have an IPM program, but it appears to deal mostly with specialty crops like apples and grapes. 
We're not aware that the Agency of Agriculture has a focus on implementing IPM in our state. However, Carrie Jaguar in a PowerPoint presentation on Neonics last year did lay out a pest scouting method to determine whether grubs or wireworms were present at levels requiring the use of treated corn seeds. So that was a good thing. I also wanted to point out that about five years ago, Ontario adopted rules requiring farmers to document the need to use corn and soybean seeds treated with neonics. They laid out the scouting pro protocols and also required that seed dealers advertise that untreated seeds were available for purchase. Now, according to 2018 seed sales data, two-thirds of the corn and soybean seeds sold in Ontario were untreated seeds simply by requiring IPM. In short, IPM works if it's implemented. And if we want to prevent a disaster in the making, we should implement it without delay. We are seeing more and more headlines about precipitous drops in insect populations. Most recently, a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences showed that mayflies declined in the northern Mississippi River Basin by 52% from 2012 to 2019. In the Western Lake Erie Basin, from 2015 to 2019, the reduction was a shocking 84%. Another study found the toxicity to insects in agricultural areas has increased 48 times, not 48%, 48 times in the past 20 years because of the use of highly toxic neonics. Entomologists in Germany documented a 75% loss of insects in natural areas over the past 20 years. The data continues to mount in study after study. We certainly can't rely on the pesticide companies to protect us from harmful effects of pesticides, nor can we rely on the Environmental Protection Agency. Historically, the risk assessment of pesticides, which the EPA requires, does not fully evaluate sensitive species. It doesn't look at ecosystem or habitat impacts. It doesn't look at secondary or non-target impacts on sublethal or low pesticide doses or pesticides registered under conditional registration, a loophole for a pesticide to get registered before all studies are done. So now the chickens are coming home to roost and it's up to us to act because Vermont is not immune from the impacts of pesticide use. If you're wondering if we're really losing insects, when was the last time you remember having to clean insects off your windshield? We need to fully monitor pesticide use in Vermont, set targets for pesticide use reduction and implement IPM, help farmers get off the pesticide treadmill and hold the agency accountable for pesticide use reduction. So I urge your support for this legislation, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, before we get too far into it, could you send us a copy of your testimony so we can refer back to some of the material? Yes, I will. Yeah, and Linda can take, take care of that for you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Are there questions? Yeah, Senator Pearson. <laughs> Thanks for being available this morning. Um, I'm, you know, you make a sort of straightforward argument that we should be using less, but one of the discussions we've been having this year is around glyphosate, and uh, very clearly its use has been increasing in Vermont. And there was a bill in front of us to ban its use. Uh, and as we explored the wisdom of that, um, you know, I would say for myself, it has some appeal to slow down a uh, pesticide that is whose use is on the increase. But banning it would likely, we've been informed, mean that people switch to a much more toxic pesticide and herbicide. And so I'm, you know, to me, I feel a bit stuck and, and maybe in this case, something that a lot of people are worrying about. Glyphosate is 
the quote unquote better option and, and I do feel sort of stuck by this dynamic but I'm curious to me that would be a scenario where maybe we do tolerate that herbicide uh, because the alternative is sort of worse. Do you, do you have a thought on that sort of dynamic? Um, well, most of my work has been done with neonics, so I know, you know, the research I've done on them, there are a number of studies show they definitely work. So, um, but I fall back on the integrated pest management um, idea and um, just looking at other options first. And I, you know, if we did that, I don't know what the other options are to replace using glyphosate, but there must be something. Well, atrazine is one of them. I mean, the, uh, yeah. No, no, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about alternative to the use of, of sure. any um, herbicide. Yeah. The alternative to herbicide use. Um, <clears throat> You know, there, there must be an integrated pest management strategy for doing that. I don't know what it is, but I think it, in, whenever we use a pesticide, we should look for alternatives first. All right. Yes, this is Senator Starr. Um, do, are you, do you live in Vermont, or do you have some connection to us? Yes, I do live in Vermont. I'm, right now I'm in Walden. Okay, so you know that we've, we've really been pushing our landowners uh, and crop growers to do, using cover crops to uh, prevent runoff uh, from the fields. Uh, and from our, our testimony that we've taken, uh, there is an alternative to to spraying this pesticide on those crops in the spring to, uh, so they can get other crops in. Uh, but it's uh, crimping and rolling, I think they call it, uh, of uh, the plants that are on the fields. But it, it hasn't been developed well enough so it works yet. And, and every, well, from what testimony we've received, as Senator Pearson stated, the alternative um, in pesticides is worse than what we're using. And you know, I don't, I don't know if we've gotten there yet to have a good uh, uh, alternative and not use any pesticides. I mean, there isn't, there isn't anyone on the committee that that I know of, uh, unless they're holding back on me, that supports using more pesticides. We're, we're trying to, to reduce them, and, uh, and we're working to, to get there, but we, and we have uh, had some successes. Um, as far as the bill goes, uh, we also have had testimony in regards to the um, makeup of the of the members, and uh, we in the bill it says that they'd like to move it from agriculture to the Department of Health. Well, in recent years, I think we had testimony to the effect that the health department wanted to get away from from this uh, crew. And I can verify that uh, through our looking back through our testimony, but it seems to me as if we've heard that in some of the testimony that's been presented. Uh, uh, and we also had testimony that, well, they should, it should be moved and the makeup should be changed because they never meet. And I think we found that to be false as well. But anyways, just a few comments in regards to what we're facing to try to balance all this. And Senator Polina has a question. Yeah, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about neonic treated seeds and what happened up in Canada. 
I presume there was a lot of resistance. I, I shouldn't presume, but I guess I'm asking whether I would expect that there was a lot of resistance to the restricting the use of the treated seeds and how that's gone over, how people are doing now dealing with it. And I also wonder whether there's been efforts in other places around the world to, I'll use the word ban, I don't know if that's, that's the right word, but restrict the use of neonic treated seeds. Um, well, in Canada, they, they established uh, rules five years ago for planting treated seeds, and it re the rules required that um, farmers um, dig holes in their fields and put potatoes or something in that would attract pests to verify that there were pests. Um, I know the grain farmers weren't happy with the, the rules. They, I think they went to court about it and lost. Uh, but the rules went into effect, and um, I've been checking the seed. They're, they're required to report their seed sales, whether they're treated or untreated seeds. And as I mentioned in my testimony, now five years later, two thirds of the seeds are untreated. Um, I've been trying to get more information from Canada about the availability of treated seeds, but there apparently isn't a problem. Um, and so I haven't, other than that, all I know is what I can find online. I have tried talking to folks in Canada, um, but I'm not getting a lot of feedback. Um, I should also mention that Quebec has now put regulations in place, re again, also requiring a demonstrated need for using neonic seeds and requiring um, a prescription from an agronomist before you can buy neonic seeds in Quebec. So, um, and as far as Europe, the uh, 28 countries in the European Union have banned the sale of, um, banned the outdoor use, banned, banned all outdoor uses of neonicotinoids, and that includes the seeds. That includes what? Oh, the seeds, is that less? That than includes seeds? the seeds as well, yes. So 28, the 28 countries of the European community? Yes. And they're still growing yeah. food? As far as I know. Just one check. Uh, other questions? No. No. Well, I, I guess, uh, Carrie, do you have any questions? Um, I guess that's it on questions, and if you could uh, send your testimony in to uh, Linda Lehman, um, we'd appreciate that so we'd have it to, you know, dig into as we alter the bill or move forward or whatever we're going to do. So thank, thank you very much. I'd be happy much. to get that. Yeah, and thank you very much for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And I'll continue to listen in. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, so... Nat. That's Nate. Nate. Nat. Um, yeah. And you know, uh, you heard us introduce ourselves, so yep. we move right along. Yep. And uh, so you... Good morning. Thanks for letting me come talk to you on this beautiful snowy day. Here's a copy of my testimony for each of you. Uh, my name is Nat Shambaugh. I live in Berlin, Vermont. And I'm a retired pesticide chemist for the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Uh, where I worked for 30 years, uh, ever since 1986, when uh, the agency first started doing pesticide monitoring of the environment. I was hired to uh, develop the analytical part of that question for the agency of ag 30 something years ago so you've been in before I yes i've been in before years. talking about pesticides and tile drains mm -hmm. and neonics yep. a couple times over the last few years yeah um so again i've been involved in pesticide issues in vermont for ages <laughs> um i like i said i helped set up the analytical end of the uh, environmental monitoring program for pesticides for the Agency of Ag. Uh, I was involved in starting up the surface water monitoring program for the Agency of Ag in 2000 um, when 
uh, Bill did that? Or? Yeah, well, it was because of the deformed frog problem way back then. No, so, right, yeah, yeah. so DEC, Millbury College, and us at the Ag Department got a grant to look into the deformed frog issue and look at pesticides and whether they were contributing to it. I don't remember it. this one. What's this? 2000 about? Oh, it's just before. 99, it? something like that. Was that the campaign that had uh, bounty on them for kids collected them? And yeah. <laughs> yep. So what, what uh, the result of that was we didn't find any evidence that <clears throat> pesticides were related to the deformed frog issue, but we did discover that atrazine in particular was <laughs> present everywhere all the time. So we could find atrazine in Lake Champlain samples in the spring, so before planting, before spraying, so it was left over from the previous year. We were finding atrazine in Lake Champlain from top to bottom, so 300 feet down we could detect it, so it is there all the time. Um, and then that expanded on to things like golf course monitoring, surface water runoff railroad monitoring, and uh, neonicotinoid monitoring. So it was nice to hear the update from the agency yesterday on uh, neo -NICs and what they've been doing lately. And if you are interested, I'll be happy to talk about that a little bit at the end, if you want me to discuss what we did yesterday. The atrazine um, applications are a little bit alarming because for years, we were tapering down, but now the reports are coming in that's headed yeah, Back that's up. definitely a concern. I, I'll be talking about that a little bit more yeah, later on, too. Because um, what I'm here to talk about today is the need for the Agency of Agriculture to update their pesticide regulations and to reinvigorate the Pesticide Advisory Council, BPAC. Those are two issues that I've been uh, paying attention, attention to for a long time. Uh, whenever I had the opportunity, I went to BPAC meetings because part of my job was to find out what problems were out there before they became problems. So I paid attention to pesticide use data for 30 something years uh, and went to feedback meetings to find out what their concerns were before it became uh, thrown at me, so to speak, <laughs> as a chemist. You, were you the rep from the agency on that board or you just No, no, I just went as a employee just to yeah. observe and be there to answer pesticide questions. And that's meeting. usually like back early, that was Phil Benedict and then Jim Leland. Exactly. And yep. so you you were working with them all through the Oh yeah, years. yep, Phil hired me way back when. So, <laughs> uh, so yes, way back when it was the Vermont Department of Agriculture before it came to be In food Portland. and markets or the agency or anything else, it was just plain old Vermont Department of Agriculture. Okay, so on the first page uh, of my testimony uh, in blue is the preamble to the Vermont uh, Regulation for the Control of Pesticides from the Ag Department Agency's web page. Uh, so I won't read the whole thing, but this is the intro to the regulations that agency uses to regulate pesticides, and it specifies that the department will use integrated pest management in a way as to make sure that pesticides are used in an environmentally responsible way. So it's right there in the preamble that they want to use integrated pest management. Integrated pest management, as you probably know, focuses on pest prevention and only using pesticides as needed. Unfortunately, if you actually read the regulations, integrated pest management is not uh, defined anywhere in the regulations and not even mentioned anywhere in the regulations. So how can you regulate pesticide use if you're not even defining what it is or integrated in, into the rules? So uh, again, the, these regulations were written in 1991. It's way past time for the agency to bring these into the 21st century and require integrated pest management as their preamble implies that you only use pesticides when they're needed. Um, and that is uh, then subsumed by their other issues. Um, part of that is, according to statute, the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council's duties. Uh, 
So their duties are listed in green. I won't read any of that, but uh, essentially the function of BPAC is to advise state government on using pesticides safely and recommending policies to reduce the use of pesticides. And BPAC is currently not doing that because they are again subsumed by the day-to-day -day issues of uh, regulating the permit that they are responsible for, golf courses and right of ways and mosquito control and so on, which are important issues, but they aren't policy, and BPAC was set up to advise state government, the legislature, the governor, and everybody on policy issues for pesticide use in the state. Um, it's been around since 1970, um, but it's gradually been uh, its duties have been, like I said, taken up by these permitting issues that they uh, are required to do by statute, but it takes up more time than it should because they should be working on policy issues, not the details of what's permitted for what, which suite of, which section of railroad track or whatever. <laughs> uh, EPAC current membership is uh, made up primarily of professionals, uh, DEC, Fish and Wildlife, Forest and Parks, <coughs> Ag, B-Trans are all agencies that have representatives and they all use or regulate pesticides in one way or another. Um, I think the pack should be reinvigorated and expanded to include uh, more individuals with expertise in minimizing pesticide use and the environmental consequences of pesticide use. So I suggest you expand that to include a, a representative of NOFA and a representative of the Rubenstein School at UVM uh, and also to stop and reassess the members and whether the current mem individuals are the appropriate ones for looking at policy rather than technical issues and that's up to the individual agencies to decide, of course. Is the Rubenstein School, is that the College of Le Ag and Life Sciences? Uh, it, no, which it's, is, it's, it's environmental. I don't remember what they're Okay, doing. so that's not currently in the Natural bill resources. right now. Do you know John no. Erickson at all? Yes. He's through, he's, he, he has been the head of the Rubenstein School. Got it, okay. Isn't he gone? Well, well, gone is gun part of it. Oh, part of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so EPAC needs to concentrate on the big picture questions of what it's supposed to do according to statute and not get buried in the details of, of individual permits. So that should be part of the rewrite of the pesticide regulations in my opinion. Um, the third issue I want to address is the pesticide use data that the agriculture agency collects, which you've been hearing a little bit about in the news I think the BT Digger article and so on have talked about the new pesticide use data that the Ag Agency posted online not too long ago. And so both Agency of Ag and VPAC need accurate pesticide use data to be able to make policy decisions, and currently that has not been available. So, so well, yeah, it, it dragged for a while, right? Uh, quite a while. <laughs> yeah, quite years. a while. Uh, at at um, least, yeah. <laughs> but that report, you you sat in on our meeting yesterday. Yes. That I thought that report that was quite thorough. Yesterday's report from Miner and. Yes. Yes. I have a few questions I'd love to ask Erica or Carrie about that. But um, yes, it was great to hear. But it wasn't really talking about pesticide use issues, which is what I. Talking about right now, it was talking about what they've been finding as far as environmental well, monitoring. But if, if no, I won't. We'll, we'll <laughs> keep going. Okay. Um, so the data that has been available is, has been questionable for quite a long time and slow to be published. And that's you know it's it's intricate, detailed data they're trying to collect and complicated. And I understand it's you know very time consuming. And, especially if you're doing paper copies of everything. Um, but nobody can make good policy decisions if you have, don't have good data. So that figure on the, in the middle of page three, 
uh, the line in orange is the atrazine use data on corn that I accessed from the Agency of Ag webpage in 2018 when I was looking at pesticide use. So uh, accessing the data on their webpage in 2018, it looked like atrazine use on corn was decreasing by about 4,000 pounds per year. So that's great. Yeah. So I didn't pay much attention to it again until this new data came out where uh, new and improved data shows that it's actually increasing by upwards of 2,000 pounds per year statewide for the last 10 years, eight years. So uh, again, that's an issue that somebody should be paying attention to, but they either VPAC or Agency of Ag, but you can't if you don't have that data. So nobody can perform their role on policy issues without good data. So uh, I think it's imperative that uh, agency bags uh, feed or held the fire a little bit to make sure that they get this data out and that it's accurate within 12 months so of when, the end of the year. When did you uh, leave the agency? Uh, 2016. So if you look on your chart, 2016, mm -hmm. it, we were at the low point, or uh, almost to the low point, probably in 15. Well, if, oh, if you look at the orange line, but the orange line isn't accurate. The orange line is that's, wrong. That's the wrong data. That's the data they had on their web two years ago, but it's wrong. The blue line is what they're publishing now, and they hopefully are, it's better data than what was published two years ago. A lot of stuff what? fell through the cracks <laughs> But we'll, we'll check that out. In the so uh, uh, here is a chart. I don't have this in your information, but this is a chart. Again, the orange is uh, the old data that I had from, for atrazine use uh, from 1985 when I started looking at this data all the way up till. 2018 most current data. So the orange line you can see there was a, a general trend down and then in the, about the year 2000 atrazine use peaked and that's when EPA regulated atrazine more because it was showing up in the environment a lot and Roundup Ready corn came on the market which mean, meant that they were using more glyphosate to controlled. So that's, that's where this drop-off is. By 2007, atrazine use had dropped a lot and because glyphosate was taking over and atrazine was being discouraged. Um, the blue line again is the most current data that Ag Department is showing which shows that it's going right back up again, atrazine use. So even though the intent of uh, Roundup Ready corn was to discourage the use of the traditional corn herbicides like atrazine and replace it with glyphosate. Uh, it happened for a little while, but now it's, they both are increasing. So here's a chart. The line across the top is acres of corn in Vermont. The blue is atrazine use, and the uh, so, orange, brown, whatever it is, is glyphosate use. So again, in around 2007, there was virtually no glyphosate used on corn because Roundup Ready corn had not become common for field corn. But it has <clears throat> been increasing steadily ever since until now a large percentage of that yeah, herbicide on corn is glyphosate, but atrazine has not decreased. Is that the one? So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I continue to express this feeling of being trapped. Uh, <laughs> I really do feel trapped, and, and I'm not sure what we do that. But um, so it's this room. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. the first linear chart yep. that has a big dip because by when gly corresponding to glyphosate coming sort of yep. maturing in the yep. market. Then. I'm going to guess that that stopped working as effectively and people said, you know what, I like better with that. I mean, is there, a, so, so we tried it and so something changed. Except like they, I say, it's still. Well, that's increased. what, that's my question is, is so, but it seems as if they decided to double up. 
Exactly. And that's so what in your research, is. you know, do we have a better explanation? Uh, well, the in the uh, DT Digger article, it was mentioned that atrazine is cheap, and so, but whether, but it's not replacing glyphosate; it's on top of glyphosate. So, uh, again, what I want to uh, emphasize is that these sorts of issues, VPAC should be doing. That's their job to look at pesticide use, or should be their job. Look at pesticide use, look at trends, and figure out how to minimize the use and risk of pesticides. And right now, nobody's doing that. Yeah. The Agency of Ag isn't doing that, and VPAC isn't doing that. Well, I, somebody's doing it, because we have Gary in twice a week here, and you know, to talk about pesticide use and what's good, what's bad, uh, what we could do to reduce the consumption or the use of it, and and I mean, but it isn't happening on the ground, as far as I can tell. You know, uh, there is nobody saying to farmers, uh, "How can you use less pesticides?" It's we don't think you should use this one, atrazine, for instance. But it's not. How do we do without as much herbicides? Is it possible? And how do we do that? Just remind me, of atrazine and glyphosate, do they do the same thing? Like glyphosate is a universal herbicide. It right. kills everything. Atrazine is more selective. Okay. Uh, Rose had a question. So, um, well, I have a question and then just a comment. I mean, I, I mean, I, I feel similar to Senator Pearson, but what, in addition to that sort of feeling trapped, I, I'm really frustrated that what we do in our six months here with pesticides seems sort of scattershot. It seems like, okay, this is the one that has made the news, so we're gonna focus on that. And so we have a bill on glyphosate. And then, you know, we're continuing to hear about neonics, and so we have another bill on neonics. And then, you know, we have one on chlorpyrifos because right. there's that's been in the news. Sure. And then I see the data and I, you know, I saw the data when Carrie presented us to originally and I, my question was, well, hey, what about atrazine? What the heck is that? And is that bad? Should we be focusing on that? And then yesterday, I don't know if you were in the room, yep. you were in the room and I saw the data and I was like, well, should we be looking at varroicides? We're using those a lot. Mm. And, and so it seems really scattershot that we as legislators are not experts. So what we're not getting is a really comprehensive look at use of pesticides and herbicides um, so we can track it and and really focus on the ones that we should be focusing on and um, trying to prevent the as you say the increase in pesticide pesticide use um, so you know I don't even know if we're looking at the right ones and and, and so then my question is, is that who chairs this committee and can we get the VPAC and can we get them in here to testify? Yeah, I thought we had Carrie in already on right, Do you chair? Once. Do you chair it? We've solicited a chair. The that past chair from the Department of Health retired um, because the, there's a lot of issue there. But as the health department, she was asked, the health department being um, designated by the health department commissioner they asked to step down as chair the, so there's no standing. chair that's the, so the VPAC is, supposed, VPAC is supposed yeah. to be advising us and you carrie is not on VPAC, right you're yes, not I am. okay yes, not so okay but you're not the chair i mean it seems to me that that, that this is an an entity that's supposed to be advising the policy makers on what kind of policy and the regulators on what kind of regulations and so I, I'm, I don't know why we haven't had somebody besides Carrie in from that. Not that I don't you, I you, appreciate you. The but. members were in the room when you when this came up. Okay. Um, the Andy Shively was sitting in the corner. He represented. Well, I, we haven't him. had somebody in that chair saying I'm from VPAC and this is what we're doing. So, uh, part of what I'm uh, suggesting in my testimony is that, uh, in addition to reinvigorating VPAC, that uh, a staff member be hired to be a staff person for VPAC. 
So working for the chair rather than working, I mean, an employee of the agency of ag, of course, but under the direction. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> under the direction of yeah, the chair. Yeah, they've only added about 40 people over there in the last three years. Yeah. So <laughs> but that's one more one. So, so I think, you haven't gotten through your testimony. So, no, I haven't. And I don't want to take up the whole time because I have to go soon. But, uh, so, uh, <laughs> I would offer the suggestion that you up the pesticide reg registration fees a little bit in order to hire a full time staff member to work at VPAC whose job would be to take the data that Agency of Ag gets and interpret it and do the research necessary that the that VPAC requires to make policy decisions, make presentations to you and the House Ag Committee and anybody else who needs it or wants it, at least once a biennium, an official report and presentation, which VPAC used to write a report to the legislature, which uh, was not Paid attention to, <laughs> so uh, require actually a presentation to you all on how the, what they are doing to minimize the risk and use of pesticides. Uh, Chris, one of the ideas that surfaced, I'm intrigued by. I'm curious on your quick take is, you know, there there there's a permit process. You know, you have to apply to have permission to use pesticide. You have to be a certified applicator. But there's no point in that chain where anyone has to even say that it's required. That it, and it's the, the term that is pointed to me is prophylactic, right? And that does seem troubling to me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, if we have to accept these chemicals as part of the business, surely we would agree that it just shouldn't be automatic. It would, should be a reaction. Exactly. Needing the technology. What if, you know, maybe we could fall short of getting a staffer, but what if we just simply required people to assert that this was necessary? Is that even worth entertaining, or is that just going to be a box that gets checked in this place? I think opinion? it's a, a excellent idea. It would require, I think, the rewrite of the pesticide regulations that I suggested needed to be done. Uh, For example? But you would, you need to figure out a way to make sure it's not just a box that gets checked. Yeah. Right. Because for example, that's what the you know, the treated seeds, that's how it's dealt with in I think it's Ontario or Ottawa, Ontario. They have to show that there's evidence that they need to use them in order if they're gonna use them. They can't prove they need them and they can't use them. And right. that's what the, the neonic it, bill that's on the wall like would do the, the same the thing. It would say again. that you can't use it unless you show a need that you unless you show that you need it. And that should be inherent in the, right. all of our regs for pesticide use, as right. far as I'm concerned. You you shouldn't be using them unless there's a problem. I mean, they are recognized as poisons. Well, they're economic poisons. They so certainly they're, they're are. Many people use poison any time they want. Well, I mean, how this all got started and, and used really bad was because there weren't any being used. And we don't hear the horror stories of our food crops and what happened back in the, in the 30s and in the 40s. And that's why DDT came along was to, because we couldn't even feed ourselves because uh, we didn't have anything to protect uh, our soils and it got carried away. And, well, that's a longer conversation. I mean, we were feeding ourselves pretty well with, we were not only treating, eating, feeding ourselves, but we were doing it without causing as many cancers before we started using a lot of chemicals. So, well, you didn't, there's no evidence that chemicals are what have kept us from. You didn't eating. get back into the Dust Bowl days and see those people <laughs> out in the Middle West and the Midwest. No, I wasn't there, but I, I'm pretty sure that we were feeding well, that's ourselves. that's history. <laughs> so, uh -huh. prior to the Neo Nick treated seeds, my understanding is I wasn't paying a lot of it. I'm not a farmer, but uh, my understanding was that they would broadcast spray the field with an insecticide if they had a problem. So it wasn't automatic every spring field corn was sprayed with insecticides. Oh. I mean, I grew up on a farm and uh, 
freaking atrazine truck came every. That's an herbicide, though. I'm talking about insecticides, which is what the neonics are for, you know, wor well, army worm and wire worm and so on. So. Uh, but neonics, we, you sat there and heard that report yesterday. Not a bit found in the water streams of either runoff waters or the tile drainage waters. Can I you don't respond to that? that. Uh, so if you look at the data, they find the neonics all the time in tile uh, drainage water. data? Um, they, as reported yesterday, have not found neonics at levels above acute toxicity levels, but they are finding them above okay. chronic toxicity levels. So my question for you all is, sure. how? what proof do you need that there's a chronic problem with neonics? So the chronic numbers are based on a 21-day average? Right. We're not finding those averages for 21 days. If you look at your neonic data that we generated in 2015 for Jewett Brook, which uh, is a very highly ag-impacted stream, uh, we looked for neonics over a one-month period eight times and detected one of the neonics eight times, seven of those above the chronic level. So the, the Chronic level for clothianidin is 0.05 parts per billion, and the average of those eight samples over a 30-day period was 0.15, so three times the chronic level. So uh, I was just at, at jury duty the other day, so uh, they keep talking about burden of proof and probable, uh, whatever they call it. So in my view, there's clear evidence that there is a possibility or probability of chronic problems in highly impacted streams, but you can't prove it unless you try hard to find it. Um, yeah. Um, Trapped. I think, have you got more testimony? Uh, you can read what up the details more than I have. We again. still have uh, one more. We have one more person. So, well, so can I, I just want ask to ask one quick question on the bill. You, uh, you suggested that that one that rep from NOFA and Rubenstein are gunned. Were there other ch specific suggestions you have on the language in the bill, or uh, I don't uh, think that it's uh, highly important that it gets moved over to the health department. Okay. You and don't. No, I think it's more important that accountability be built in to both well, agency of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carrie would okay. like to get it moved like that. <laughs> um, well, okay. th thanks for your time well, and yep. yesterday as well as today. Of course. And I think we have Mike. Are you on the phone? It, yes, sir. Yeah, um, we've got a few minutes here to work you into our discussion and um, so has did you hear the introductions of our members i did okay so why don't we get the rolling and the um, floor is yours thank you sir um i do have some uh i'm, I'm calling in from home um, i'll introduce myself first yeah. Uh, Michael Ball calling in from Royalton, Vermont. Um, I'll give you my, my job description qualifications in just a second. But I did have thoughts on Senator Hardy's question on why there's such a scattershot array of bills and legislation year after year. And then there was also a question about roller crimping and effective alternatives and so forth. Um, I guess I would ask you, uh, Chairman Starr, would you rather hear my thoughts right now or go straight into testimony? Well, we've got about eight minutes before the bell rings uh, for us to go onto the floor, so which, maybe give us your thoughts. <laughs> oh, first, who, who are you? <laughs> and where are you from? <laughs> a Royalton. Yeah, tell us a little bit. Hey about yourself, Michael. Will do, thank you. Um, okay, so 
I'll just say good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Michael Ball. I'm self-employed. I'm the founder, owner of an invasive species company called Got Weeds. And I've been doing the work on, at this point, thousands of acres throughout New England. And this is my 10th, I'm entering my 10th growing season, uh, again, as a sole proprietorship. I manage terrestrial plants with non-chemical methods over extended time frames. I also prune apple trees and I garden. I'm, I do not claim to farm. I know plenty of farmers. Um, but I garden and I prune apple trees, which I've already begun for the season. Um, I believe those are my qualifications to speak today, and I've also got written here. I have attended numerous VPAC meetings since perhaps the 2013 timeframe, solely for the purpose of educating myself at my own expense. I have listened to those meetings, and I have occasionally submitted comments. So. That's who I am and where I'm coming from. Mike, Mike um, j just so I understand, Senator Pearson, what is an invasive species company? What is it? What is, isn't that what you said? Terrestrial, not aquatic. Terrestrial invasive species. I do vines, shrubs, trees, and invasive plants. And you're trying to mitigate them? I am doing everything from suppression to eradication. Okay. People ask me what I do, and I tell them I transition landscapes. Okay. So they, I, I invite them to tell me what their vision is, where they want to be, and then I make no promises to do anything within 30 days. I tell them I will get you there. This is the program that will accomplish what you want. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, well, let me... We, uh, well, Pearson, since you had the since you had the question on the on the roller crimping, you can look up RodaleInstitute.org. Rodale is spelled R-O-D-A-L-E. RodaleInstitute.org roller crimping, and you can read about how important timing is, and some of the considerations with how to how to roller crimp a field that you're trying to no till. I did have an organic farmer tell me once. Atrazine is for people who don't know how to farm. I thought that was, I thought that was a pretty clear statement. Um, I'll continue now here with my testimony. Um, I want to acknowledge that the membership of the VPAC does operate professionally and can be proud of worthy accomplishments. I have said in the past, however, that the overall performance of the, v, of the VPAC is still a mission fail. This leads to my overriding point today. The failure of the VPAC does not rest on the shoulders of the council alone, but rather is a reflection of the national fascination with better living through chemistry. When VPAC was created, the stated goals were a fit for that moment in time. No member of the public then could have known that herbicides would become such a profit maker with more and more uses identified and recklessly promoted. The desire for ever more profit has driven us to this day and age where our, our usage is exponentially more than was even conceivable in earlier times. The global warming scenario offers a parallel example, immediate profit ahead of common sense and scientific integrity. So we sit here today facing not only a massive increase in annual usage, but also an unknown toxic legacy resulting from decades of untracked pesticide usage. We may have tracked select quantities over select time spans, but we have not tracked or explored cumulative effects that may contribute to declining soil health. So the urgency today is real, very real, much more so than in previous decades. I'm gonna skip a point about public participation. I know we're pressed for time. Yeah, we got about three minutes, uh, Mike. All right, thank you. Uh, I would love to, I did share these notes with Linda Lehman there, so you have them. They're on yes, the oh. we do have okay. your testimony. Okay, I'm going to move on. My, my, the point that I'm skipping is public participation, public engagement is absolutely broken in the world of attending meetings and getting, getting public engagement. It's a broken piece of the equation. I'm gonna carry on now. VPAC 
talking about the council, not getting the information it needs to empower its decision making. Consider 2016. The summer of 16 brought essentially no rain to the southern reaches of the state and central mass. This severe drought condition equates to major stress on all types of vegetation, as well as on soil microbes. There were also at the time three species of exotic pest, beetles, in the immediate vicinity. So you know about hemlock woolly, Asian longhorns, and emerald ash borer. Why would any, in 2016, why would any regulatory or advisory body permit the use of pesticides or toxins under such drought conditions? In a climate of today with more disturbance events and huge swings in water table and ground conditions, why would we seek to introduce yet more stress into that landscape? That never comes into the conversation. We even have power companies doing test runs on new pesticides in southern Vermont. How does this happen? Where are the universities and the scholars and the stewards? We know the beetles are seeking out weakened trees. And if the drought were not bad enough, why is there no discussion of cumulative effects, long-term health? I was at that meeting and it fell to me, a member of the public, to recommend to the power company that they might wish to coordinate with their county forester, if nothing else. It's experimenting with herbicides in a stressed situation. Anyone that does maple sugaring knows annual sugar production traces back through the years and depends on many contributing factors. So we cannot just operate in a bubble. I want to say as well that pesticide usage is now an environmental constant. Like acid rain once was and like migrating passenger pigeons once were, the annual application of tons of pesticides is an environmental stressor that will kill off some species while forcing others to evolve as survivors. And those survivors will require yet stronger chemistries to suppress them. And rather than functional soil and healthy plant communities, we will pursue ever more powerful and profitable synthetic toxins. My, Even my today, uh, if, away, if you took away glyphosate today, the people would still use what they're finding on the internet. Right. Yeah, we, the bell is ringing and we've got to go up to the Senate floor, so um, we're going to have to excuse ourselves. And we have your testimony, and sorry we didn't have more time for you, but we'll re read through your testimony, and uh, you can follow what we're doing on the bill on our web page. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank Mike. you.